Yeah. If I'm in here and I poke, mm -hmm. then we get that little bend. Now this gives me the lines that I need to I'm follow toast. up. I'm toast. <laughs> Welcome to Blade HQ, everybody. Today I am here with Patrick Odell, defensive tactics instructor and master of edged combat. And we have asked him for a few selections of his favorite tactical knives and then some of y'all's favorite tactical knives as well. You excited? Very much so, very much so. It's like a kid in a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited too, and I'm especially curious about this first knife you chose. This one is tiny. Yeah, it doesn't look like much, but um, as a defensive tool, this is a great knife just because when you start thinking of your reverse grip, the idea with this is if you run into any type of obstruction when you're defending yourself, having that curve enables you to redirect or hook or clear out of the way. Um, when you have experience in uh, defense clinch fighting, like wrestling or uh, any type of Filipino martial arts, one of the things you learn to negotiate is that really close space. And a lot of times when you have a tool in a forward grip, it allows people to get leverage on the tool and can also make it a little easier for them to isolate and disarm you. It's so, kind of on their side of the fight instead of yours. Yeah, yeah, and it's really just leverage. The further the tool gets away from your center, the easier it is to pry it away. And as you see, there's not really a lot of this that hangs out that isn't really just the business end of it. So mm -hmm. it doesn't allow for you to get enough leverage to pry on it, but mm -hmm. also you can you know, hook the arm out of the way and clear and still cut, so. So I'm just imagining that knife in your hand real quick. Mm -hmm. So say it's like this, and I say I'm gonna try and wrestle this from you. What am I gonna do? Grab this? <laughs> like, exactly. Like you, no, you can really you. kind of you could pry on the back end, but even one of my instructors, he goes, "Yeah, okay." You know, he pulls out his real knife and he's like, "Pry it out of my hand," you know, because it's uh, they work it in the art form. But when you don't have enough real estate to get a good purchase on, mm -hmm. it minimalizes the chance of it being taken away. And the other thing here is that it just fits really good into your hand. If for some reason you had to draw your knife and then had to try to reach for your gun, you could fit a secondary tool in your hand with this and still be able to support and not have to uh, ditch one tool for the next. So um, any, anyhow, these are kind of a staple. The, um, the original maker behind this, he, uh, he does some amazing versions of it as well, where he'll do, he'll do like, and... yeah, cord wraps or a manuki, and um, you know, it, it's just, it's really a matter of um, the baseline model, I mm -hmm. guess you'd call this, and then you, you could sauce it up a bit if you want a fancy one, but. I mean, there's a lot, I imagine you run into guys carrying like STI 2011s, yeah. $2,000 pistols. Yeah, it's the same thing, you know, you see like the guys with the Gucci Glocks and then guys just running a standard Glock like bare bones, you know, but, mm -hmm. but I can't help but um, acknowledge this as a defense tool. There's also a major benefit. When you think about only being able to reach to your actual reach of influence, not to diminish the value of any of these tools, but because it's so much longer, it could be seen as uh, maybe a mutual aggression because you're more likely to pursue somebody. Um, mm -hmm. With this particular tool to be effective, you have to come within my reach. So um, a lot of the, the defense knives that we recommend tend to be more of a reverse grip oriented. Okay, so some of these bigger fixed blades might be something you'd find on the vest of a soldier or something. Somebody yeah, who's or, doing or an even machine. utility, like, you know, where we live here with the mountain ranges, you know, we're right by Timpanogos. This is a type of knife if I was going to go up and, and be out at the reservoir and be camping and, you know, I'd see it more in the utility side or as like something for my plate carrier or for my battle belt, you know, when I'm needing an actual fixed blade knife. Um, but this is something so small. You can just tuck this into your waistband and then <laughs> exactly. if you get cornered, you're not without help. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it has such a slim profile. What I've done with mine is I've actually reversed the clip and put it on the inside so that it 
it rides against my body and it's not off of my belt. I guess so the flat side it, of yeah. that Kydex must make it nice and comfortable too. It does, it's really nice. You wouldn't think I just had to use a couple grommets to space it a little bit, but it gave me a different carry that, I, I do VIP protection, um, you know, I'm trained for youth recovery and transport. So there's a lot of times where I'm armed, but I don't want to like be screaming it. So mm -hmm. this gives a nice tight profile to my body, but if I need to get a tool out quickly, it's, you know, it's very easy to use. Yeah. And what I love about Bastinelli is, like you were kind of hinting at this, is they call it tactical art. So, I mean, <laughs> true. you heard it from the expert here. This is a great self-defense knife, but is it not also so good looking? Like, just open a box yeah, with absolutely. that, you're gonna feel super cool. <laughs> yeah, you can really tell when the bladesmiths uh, actually train blade, you know? I mean, you think you get something like that, even with just some basic boxing experience. And you're, it's gonna be you're in a, business. Yeah, it's gonna be nasty. Yeah, and the next one you picked is a folder. Mm -hmm. So this one, I, I believe I want to call it a pical. Is that what you call it? Yeah, the, um, the if my dialect is even <laughs> right, uh, pical. pical. It's, um, it, it really is a unique blade style. You're going to see a lot more of these. There's actually a gentleman uh, in the defense industry named uh, Ed Calderon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess Ed's mom used to carry a, a fruit knife. and. She would carry it with the reverse grip and change the orientation. And it really did kind of revive this blade style. This is very common in the Philippines, in certain regions, but when you think of a traditional fruit knife, a lot of times people use it to harvest fruit with their thumb as the backer. Mm -hmm. So when you think of this, it's similar to your traditional harvesting knife. Okay. But um, when you have this in your reverse grip, unlike your karambit, this will cut while clearing, so. <laughs> so you're hooking that arm out of the way yeah. and just gonna regret it real quick. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's the thing is like a lot of times when I'm teaching uh, young ladies or, or smaller teenagers, uh, they're concerned that their aggressor is gonna be bigger, stronger, you know. Um, and it, when you think about those as factors, um, leverage, you know, I might have to work a little harder, mm -hmm. but when it's biting you along the way, it, it makes it a lot easier. Now, this is just traditional fox um, craftsmanship all the way. So when you actually flail this knife, if you wing it hard enough, you can actually open it upon deployment. And then so, that edge is like right coming down yeah. to you. That's terrifying. <laughs> so um, <laughs> unfortunately though, there's no trainer for this one. So please, if you um, if you do that, it's at your own uh, <laughs> it's your peril. <laughs> Blade HQ is not but, responsible. Uh, exactly. This is where the disclaimer comes in. But <laughs> um, you know, this is a unique style. The only thing that kind of threw me a little bit about this is you do have to kind of have enough space to open backwards and then move forward because of your wave feature being on the rear portion of the knife. So you gotta um, like pull it against the back, but yeah, you gotta grab by the rear. Yeah, I'll, I'll give a little brief demonstration here, but when you see here, I have to kind of move this backward before I can actually move forward with it. Mm -hmm. So um, it does kind of change the dynamic of trying to move forward off your draw. Um, but when you think of defensively, a lot of people try to, you know, body block their knife a little bit maybe before they move forward with it. Mm -hmm. So if you have a stealthier deployment, this is a great knife if you have a little bit of time to get it out. Um, if you have to do it under pressure, you have to have that in your mindset that your arm will have to move behind the median before you can move forward. So and, you gotta uh, train that, like you said. Yeah, and you, and you have to understand too that mechanically, um, once your arm moves behind the middle of your side, your median, uh, you don't have as much of a, a dynamic of strength coming forward. So, mm -hmm. um, so you just have to train to move your body more instead of just your arm. That way you can move the median, kind of, so to speak. But these are a great knife. I actually got one of the prototypes when they were <laughs> when they you were being the handed <laughs> around. Um, yeah, it, just to give a little feedback and and get my hands on it early. Because I have all of my students; they're definitely curious and they want to, um, you know, get on some of these newer technologies. But yeah, I gotta say that's one of the weirder looking knives. It almost looks like a like a a Loch Ness Monster or something. <laughs> but yeah. like when you put it in your hand, like you feel powerful. <laughs> yeah. I suppose you kind of are. You know, it has a great ergonomic to it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a big fan of the Pical in general. 
you know, I, I like these folders because I feel like it encourages somebody to carry a knife that otherwise might not just commit to a fixed blade. Unfortunately, you know, when I talk with the gals that are wearing their yoga pants or, you know, they're, um, they're just running to Walmart real quick, they don't want to uh, have a fixed blade on. So these are really nice to be able to have a folder that still meets the type of knife that you would train with for defense and, and gives you an option where you're going to carry it more often. Mm -hmm. And that's honestly not huge. Like, I have my Benchmade Freak in my pocket, and this is markedly smaller. Right. And I'd call this just an everyday carry knife. Exactly. Like, this is, like, that is tiny, but a truly potent self-defense tool, too. Yeah, and I think where these um, folders with the Karambit ring get discredited a little is that um, even if you don't want to be in a lethal situation, it makes a heck of an impact tool. Yeah, you know? just holding it like this and just... Yeah, if you think of bony areas, if, if somebody were to grab you and you just smash the top of their hand with that thing, it's... I would let go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, you know, it's a motivator, so... Mm -hmm. And then next up, we have another Karambit, and this one is made by Fox, but it's a Bastinelli design. I believe they call it the Blackbird. Yeah, if you look at this one, it's got a little bit more of your traditional ramp design instead of the, uh, the Emerson wave. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little different on the deployment, but if you ask me, it tends to be a little friendlier on your pants, too, <laughs> when you're practicing the deployment a lot. I mm -hmm. love the wave, and it's such an amazing technology, and it was, it was really a cool feature that everybody else got to kind of accentuate in different ways. Um, this Blackbird folder is a really nice price point, too, for people that are wanting to get into a Karambit but not break the bank. I see these and, are for like 130 Yeah, and, and there's a trainer available for this, too. So, you know, like you, your other designs that come out of Fox, um, once the production gets ramped up a little bit, they're able to produce trainers for them. But um, this is a very common one that my students end up with. Um, this or, or also the 599, but I, I'm a big fan of Bastion's designs. What you'll find is he just puts a little bit more energy into making a comfortable knife, I think. Like you were saying before, it uh, borders the artistic line of, of um, being very functional, but also aesthetically pleasing. Yeah, but that level of finish, I imagine, makes it really handy and really comfortable for somebody like yourself who's a professional in this. Like. You, yeah. probably, you probably have a knife in your hand a lot more often than the average person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, I've had ones where they, you know, they feel like a brick. And then you have others that just feel really smooth in your hand and they're comfortable to flow and they move naturally. So um, with this type of design too, the clip allows for a little speedier deployment. When you start looking at some of the other knives that even is this produced by Fox, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you look at the the clip on this, because you have so much more surface area coverage, it's gonna be a little bit more drag on the deployment. You know, we used to actually take the clip off, we put tape around where the clip was, and we would sand down just the portion that was under the clip so you'd get a little smoother release. Mm -hmm. um, just because the G10 tends to be a little uh, gritty, you know, like sandpaper. But once you have this smoothed out, Micarta. Uh, micarta also tends to stay a little grippier once it gets wet. A little sweaty in combat. <laughs> yeah. And then, I mean, if you really don't want that drag, how about a titanium frame lock? <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> this is another one you suggested. I think this is the last one on the table. Yeah. This one I actually wanted to hold because I haven't gotten my hands on it yet. <laughs> oh, man. That I think he likes good. it. <laughs> yeah, that does feel good. And, you know, I, I don't choose as many blades with the forward grip unless I'm doing some type of utility work with them as well. If it's purely just a defensive knife for me, usually it's a reverse grip. Mm -hmm. But this does feel nice. Oh, man. I think he's in love. Yeah. <laughs> and that's such a nice flow through there. Yeah. Fox does a really great job with those frame locks and the nice well-tuned detent. As if I may. Absolutely. They like, like it flips out really smooth and then their ergonomics are so good. Italy. Yeah. The Italian companies make such good knives. I'm in <laughs> love. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That one's really cool. I like this sort of tanto but harpoon profile almost. I guess reverse harpoon. Like, So what's what's this blade style going for? I'm, I'm curious. Well, when you're thrusting, when you start making a blade that's symmetrical, that surface area, oftentimes when you're working on the trunk, 
it will flail off of a rib. Mm -hmm. So when you have this lighter profile, when you stick in, it allows for you to be able to turn and maximize the size of the wound, but with and, less and of a chance quickly. of actually like flailing in between two particular bones. Um, when you start looking at the profile of some of these that are a little wider, you can see how the profile of this blade versus this blade, if we were going in between two ribs, there would be a yeah, significant- Yeah, the fox if you're doing that. Yeah, just a significant amount of surface area contact, right? Mm -hmm. So, oops, <laughs> there. Um, but with this, you have the ability to turn or move in and crank on the way out and you're not as likely to flail off of ribs. But when you think about the thumb ramp here, it also still allows you to get that pressure because if we were to take um, a training knife and I grip here and I start pushing, the ergonomics at the end of the knife will start to weaken my grip. And then you're not but, push cutting, you're more like slicing. Yeah, exactly. And this allows a reinforced cut where I can get my skeletal structure aligned with the blade. So though there is a little bit more ability to pry out sideways, if I'm trying to do a powerful slash, being able to get up on that thumb ramp still puts pressure on the blade, but without me having to have all of that blade there for trying to carve out. Yeah, it sure is a beautiful knife. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, <laughs> I asked to get that one on the table so I could touch and feel it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tell you what, Patrick, why don't you take it home with you? Really? I'm dead serious. Oh, Thanks for wow. joining us. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. Thank you. My Thank pleasure. You. <laughs> Although, I do have a couple more knives. So these are the ones that I brought. In fact, two of these are my personal knives. Okay. And I want to hear what you have to say. And I think I might go out of order because you've been talking about karambits a little bit. Right. And we'll, we'll talk about the Lion Steel LE1 first. Okay. So this one is an Ernest Emerson design, and it has an integral aluminum handle. So you get a nice texture here, and as you can see, this is one piece of aluminum all the way around, and it has a steel lock bar insert, and then the Emerson Wave, if I can open it today. But it's a bit bigger than the Karambits you recommended. So right. how does the size of a Karambit play into all this? So I'm imagining with this being an LE model, this is something that they made oversized for a gloved hand, mm -hmm. but still able to be carried as a folder. Um, you know, what I've noticed a lot of times is like, even with your 599, which is probably your most iconic of the folder karambits, um, a lot of the bigger guys can't get their mitt in there. And especially mm -hmm. when you even take a low profile shooting glove they're, they're really not able to get all of that around without starting to hang over the blade. So it's nice to see, um, I'm not the largest guy, but I've got a, a big mitt on me. So when I glove up my hand, something like this would, it would fill up real quickly. It feels a little big in my hand right now if I were just carrying it, you know, on a civilian duty. But if I'm in a position where I'm running and I'm gloved or I'm gonna be hugging a rifle, I'm gonna have gloves on. I'm not gonna be shooting consistently. Um, you know, with a un hand. uncovered hand on a handguard, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's nice to see a, a purpose-driven duty knife because a lot of the officers, they're literally trying to find this sweet spot in between a, a functional tool, but something that they can actually carry when they're having to kick a door or approach mm -hmm. a vehicle. And a lot of times you don't wanna be rummaging around through somebody's stuff without some type of hand protection. Mm -hmm. So to see these knives coming out now where they're, you can tell they're taking input. They're taking input from the people that need to use them on a daily basis, and they're doing something valuable with it. Now, you can tell that there's a lot of ways to open this knife. <laughs> they put the wave hook. You've got a thumb pressure here. You've got a finger switch here. You've got a thumb hook here. <laughs> so they've made this knife to where regardless of what you're doing with this other hand, you should be able to get enough of it open. So whether I want that forward grip so I can pull and rip, or I'm here and I need to just get it started, it's very, very ergonomic in your hand. And even these little guys start to get to where you could just hook and pull or press and pull. So it's Ernest Emerson. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's one of the best. <laughs> right, I mean, you know, as far as um, 
you know, talking about blade makers that actually train and, and have spent enough time in the bladed arts, you could really see it coming through on the designs here. Um, mm -hmm. And it's nice to see them continuing on, you know, because they have some of their classic designs and they put out custom work, but it's nice to see something new and innovative that, you know, for officers, it's great to be able to recommend another knife because like we have what, the 599XL and, or, or what is it, the 498 is what the, sure. the bigger version is, but they're so limited. You, you can't really find them as often as the others. You can pick this so, up today at bladehq.com. Yeah, I like <laughs> that. And, and I know a guy, a big old officer, that's gonna love to get his hands on that. Yeah. So. And I guess like what you were telling us about with these guys, how these are very small and carryable mm -hmm. and like great for self-defense, that sort of thing. But if you're in a true tactical role and you're kicking a door, I don't want to be fussing with the inside of my waistband to get to my knife. I'd rather have something bigger, easier, quicker yeah. to grab. And, and I'm running into more and more officers that are seeing the value in carrying more than just one blade. Because <laughs> yes, it's great if you have a fixed blade on your dominant side, but if you need to draw something on your off side, it's going to be smart for you to have something that's got somewhat of an auto deployment feature or an assisted deployment feature, right? Yeah, and then the last karambit style knife right here, this one's mm -hmm. one of my personal ones. This is the Tour Knives Jank Shank. And it... Oh my gosh. <laughs> you can throw it at somebody if you needed to. Yeah, Doesn't... it's got a really thick spine. Yeah, yeah, it doubles as a pry bar, I take it. I, I can goodness. imagine so. <laughs> Yeah, and once again, it's got that nice thumb ramp on the back there so you can assist and it allows for you to put pressure. But once again, the, the piercing edge on this thing, it's going to allow for you to even maybe be able to work some smaller uh, soft armor. Mm -hmm. And when you start thinking about this as a thrusting weapon, it allows for clearing and poking. Um, I'm just curious how well it holds an edge. Is what's what's the steel on this? This is a CPM S thirty five BN. Okay. So it's it's a good steel. I, I think it's well suited to this. It's got solid toughness and a really good corrosion resistance as well. Yeah. And then no, I really like the scales. It's got a very nice finish to it. Yeah. Right. Tour knives are made in the USA. They're the first USA made knife we've looked at today, and they're veteran owned and operated. So. Very nice. So I believe Connor Tour is the owner, and he sort of built knives based on his experience in the military. This is one of them. I thought it was really cool, and I mostly got it because Jank Shank is way too fun to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I hear you. It is a nice name. Um, so what, what would the price point on something like this be? Um, I want to say they go for about 200 right now. Oh, yeah. I could be wrong. I'll have to look on that one. But yeah, these are really fun. I like them a lot. But... I'm glad to hear. I'm glad, I'm glad it has your seal of approval as well. <laughs> yeah, no, it feels really good in the hand. I, I'm a firm believer in poking, especially because of where we are here in Utah. You know, if uh, there's like the age old argument, you know, should I thrust or should I slash? And I, I'm a firm believer that a, a poke, you're, you're less likely to have to do a lot of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a, a slash here with where we, we live half the year, People have coats. a base layer and then their regular clothes and then maybe a jacket over that. So if you don't have a, a good amount of pressure on a slash, it may not be effective. So, um, but, but a good poke is just right yeah, there. <laughs> a good poke tends to go through layers a lot easier. And when you think of the, the surface area wound, um, you want to have the most surface area interfect, or, uh, interacted with as you can because that's what's going to give you the ability to um, affect that hydraulic system, right? And, mm -hmm. and once that happens, you'll see that effect quicker and not have to, you know, slash multiple times. Uh, as a defensive thing, if I can get one good thrust versus multiple slashes, it's going to be a lot easier of a position to defend. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, and then we have another Ernest Emerson design. You can't, yeah. you can't talk about tactical knives without a few of those. <laughs> Yeah, these are pretty cool. I, I see a lot of my students ending up with versions of this knife because they put out a very affordable trainer. Yeah, uh, in fact, over on the table, we're gonna go visit here in a few minutes, we have a trainer version of this knife. Yeah. So I'd like to see how you use it. But this one, I mean, just going off what I've learned here, this one looks like it's a forward grip style knife. It is, and it's also designed, like I said, for more of that rear opening. Mm -hmm. So 
So mm -hmm. you've got to get that wave feature moving backwards. Mm -hmm. You can tell where they drilled it, but they didn't tap it. So it, it has the ability, I've seen where guys will even find a way to switch the clip so that they can use a reverse grip and move forward with it. Huh. But yeah, these are these are a really cool knife. I I would have to say almost half of my students have this trainer in their bag just to practice with working with a forward grip blade. And I really encourage people, even if you carry something that's a reverse grip for your own preference, you still have to learn how to work with these tools because if you don't, you never know how it's gonna end up in your hand and you don't know who's gonna bring the knife to the discussion. Mm -hmm. So by still learning to manipulate the forward grip and, and really knowing how to handle it, it, it gives you a sense of dexterity that you know mm -hmm. makes you capable because you may be defending somebody you love and they're being attacked and this is what ends up in your hand. Um, so just understanding the different locking mechanisms, understanding different grips, and how to benefit from them. With a lot of our drills, we'll actually try to switch the grip up in what we're doing, um, just to encourage people to work outside of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that's why they say, like if you're gonna learn to use a fight with a rifle, you need to learn how to use an AR and an AK, because you don't know what's gonna be in your hand. Yeah, it's very true. I mean, that's the thing. You don't necessarily get to dictate the terms under which you're ambushed, mm -hmm. so. I suppose, like, say it's two, eight, 2 in the morning and you wake up to make a sandwich when nobody can judge you, and then somebody shows up in your house to judge you, and all you have is a paring knife. I'd really rather know how to fight with a forward grip. <laughs> yeah, you know, and that's the thing is, like, realistically, if you want to be capable of defending yourself, it's not just when the sun is shining and the clouds part and the heavens open up. Mm -hmm. It needs to be under terms that you might not choose. So, like I'd say it's more likely to be under terms you don't choose. <laughs> that's the thing. <laughs> Realistically, um, I, I think a lot of people, when they, they feel like they're training, um, a lot of training tends to like stroke the ego. People want to work on what they're good at. Mm -hmm. So if you're not good at certain grips or you're not comfortable with the knife in a certain way, that's something that you should exercise through rather than just avoid it and stick with the things that you're comfortable with. I really do feel like it's a matter of just building basic dexterity and you can feel all of that discomfort melt away. Um, especially when you start grappling over a, a knife. Um, in the industry, we have a tool called shock knife, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, a lot of the viewers are familiar, but it, it creates that stress response and it feels like you're getting cut the way the filaments design. But the minute you start rolling around on the ground and fighting over a knife, you start figuring out, you better know how to grip it different ways. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anywho, a little tangent there. So next up we have our Spider Co. This is the Paramilitary 2. You see these around much? Yeah, it's <laughs> built off of the classic design, right? Yeah, off the original military. But I figure it's called the Paramilitary 2, and I've seen the sales numbers. You've got to have seen these in the field. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that is so lightweight too. It feels so much better than the traditional plastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, these are really nice when you start to learn how to work this thumb hole. Mm -hmm. And then I also like the fact that they move the lock. The lock. The backside. Yeah, because even here, if you can get comfortable pulling this out, little flick of the wrist puts that into your forward grip. Now, when you start thinking about stuff like this, if I have to work in and open this up one-handed while still defending myself, it's such a simple design. And what you'll see a lot of the guys do is they'll file out a small notch here, and they and can make that into, a, into wave. a wave. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's incredible, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So a lot of your guys that are defensive, they're carrying these because you know, they can reverse the clip. They, they have a lot of functionality to them that you can modify. But I suppose a lot of versatility a, as such, well. Yeah, so, such an amazing design too. It's a classic, but with tons of variation to it. So. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that like the everyday carriers, people like myself who have never really been in a fight or trained for one at all, but they just love this knife because it looks good and because it cuts good. <laughs> yeah, well, it really is a classic design. I think one of my first knives was a traditional spider code just like that. And, um, you know, back then it was like, a, ooh, you know, it was, <laughs> it was a big deal if you had a nice spider code knife. And, um, but you, you see in the culture how much it's come along in the last 20 years. 
uh, people are willing to invest a two, three hundred dollars into a knife now, and mm -hmm. it, and that sure is an amazing product. What's the price point on that one? Uh, these go for about two hundred, I believe. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I mean, so it's almost something to save up for, but it's a great knife you can count on. Yeah, no, it definitely <laughs> gives you something to look forward to if you're carrying the original, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. And then next up, so you're telling me you're from LA, mm -hmm. so you heard of Cold Steel? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, I have. We all used to flock to the Cold Steel parking lot sale, and, um, especially with teaching a lot of uh, edged weapon stuff. We have a lot of their training weapons as well. So. Yeah, in fact, our table of trainers has several Cold Steels on it. Very cool. Yeah, this one's the Recon One, and this one is also very popular. And I, I see a tactical knife here. But what you're saying is this broader blade might not be as great for piercing, so I'm thinking maybe a slashing cut on this guy? Yeah, it would have a good slashing cut and it has a lot of utility purpose as well. You gotta figure with this being an actual recon-oriented knife, it's not just gonna be about knife fighting. Now they do get close quarters enough where the skill set comes into play, but having mm -hmm. a knife that's a functional tool as well for survival, but doesn't have to fall into the fixed blade category. When you mm -hmm. start thinking of something like this, even if I had to use this for whittling or I had to use this for tool craft, this would be a functional blade. Now bear in mind, I, I'm not saying I wouldn't want to get slashed or poked with it, <laughs> but at the same time when you see some of these other knives that look like they were designed more to interact with flesh versus being a utility tool, mm -hmm. um, this I would say is a little bit more well-rounded, so to make that a utility tool, they have to sacrifice some of that more aggressive profile that you see on uh, more of the fighting knives, right? Okay. But something like this too, if you're having to go in with a light pack or you're dropping in, it, it gives you the ability to have something that's not gonna be jamming you in the ribs every time you're trying to negotiate rough terrain. Mm -hmm. A lot of times when you wear one of these fixed blade folders, if you don't have a real long torso, you're kind of getting jabbed a lot by the knife itself. Mm -hmm. So uh, a nice oversized folder like this is a really good utility alternative, especially when you've got a nice locking, you know. Mm -hmm. That triad lock yeah. is bomb proof. It's, it's, it's a bit more reliable. Not to say <laughs> that the liner locks aren't reliable, but when you're using it as a utility tool and you're gonna be prying, that extra strength comes in handy. It does, it does, and it's just a bit more reliable and consistent. Really is a nice profile knife, though. Yeah, I really like the Recon one. I, I, I wanna take it camping when I pick it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the thing. It does feel like like a nice working class knife. Like I could see how guys, even if maybe you were in a, like a construction or something like that, it'd be mm -hmm. a great knife for you to have, carry on a daily basis. Yeah. All right, well, that's the last of our Manual folders. We are into auto territory now. All right. Starting with the budget-friendly Boker Kalashnikov. It is inspired by the rifle, and it. These are going for like sixty bucks. Yeah. And they're very popular because they come in every color and every blade shape you can imagine. Yeah, I've actually got one of these in gray, I believe. <laughs> yeah. So. How, how would you see the Kalashnikov used in a self-defense situation? You know, when you start thinking about forward or reverse grip, you have to start thinking about how the knife is going to come out of your pocket. So if I'm carrying this in my right pocket, right side, when I pull it out, I've gotta be able to pinch it with just a couple of fingers. And that allows for me to be real close to the button here. The only thing that you have to be careful about with some of these autos is that if anything inhibits the blade while it's opening, then it, it, it's not necessarily going to lock right into place. So Might need to give it a little bit of a wrist on the if side. If I give it just a little toss, and you run into this too with the um, the wave or the ramp features as well. Sometimes mm -hmm. when people will go to pull it, they don't get a good snap, and they got to give a little secondary little twitch just to get it to pop into place. <laughs> One of the other things we noticed is that even with um, with different models of these, you'll get a little bit of gunked up um, debris in there, maybe some pocket lint, and it'll kind of hinder the ability for it to lock into place. So as long as you're checking your tool daily and making sure you're keeping it lubricated and maintaining that the mechanism is all clear, these are great, especially if you have limited motion on one side, uh, limited ability. One of the gentlemen I just recommended one of these auto folders to um, has limited use of his left side from a motorcycle accident. 
So I do think that there's a great place for them. You just really need to practice the deployment and make sure you're keeping the tool maintained. Mm -hmm. I suppose with firearm ownership, like that's a big part, is make sure it's always clean, it's always lubricated, and you're always ready to go. And just treat the treat your automatic knife the same way. Make it part Absolutely. of the same routine. Absolutely. These tend to be a little bit more, I guess you'd say, analog. But when you start getting into these that rely more on a mechanism, then there's some maintenance involved. Yeah, and everyone talks about relying on mechanism. <laughs> It doesn't get much more mechanical than a Microtech Ultratech. <laughs> yeah, yeah, these are pretty much uh, one of the most well-known images in the industry. You know, you're seeing a lot of knives coming out like this, but Microtech is really one of the top of the line ones. And if you feel the button, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I noticed that really stands out to me with the Microtechs is um, there's a, a lot of tension that you put on these so that they don't accidentally open, right? Mm -hmm. But the way that that Microtech, it, it like grabs your finger when you go to push on it. So it sure does feel good. Doesn't take a lot of oomph to move it. Um, and just bear in mind, even if somebody got in the way and they hindered the deployment on this guy, because it's not a side swinging deployment, mm -hmm. you're going to at least get a little bit of a bite if it's directly on the skin. But once again, if this is hindered and the deployment is hindered, then it's going to create a knife that you have to pull to lock into place. Um, I don't know if you've ever toyed around with these and hindered mm -hmm. the mechanism on them, but if you're uh, feeling that fight or flight mechanism and you've got that auditory exclusion or the tunnel vision that comes with it, and you pull your knife and you start moving forward before you fully ejected the blade, you might run into a little bit of an issue. So you really need to work the deployment of these tools. Yeah, so I have a coworker named Jacob just over here, mm -hmm. and he likes OTFs a lot for like everyday carry stuff. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Microtech slides, they chew up my thumb. And to what I say to that is like, this is a weapon, man. Like you're carrying oh, yeah. this to defend yourself. You want something that you can get a dependable open with. Yeah. And then to your point of having your having the deployment in hindered and you mm -hmm. come off track. With my Ultratech, what I found is I can just flick it out. And it locks in. And it locks it yeah, in place. Yeah, I don't think my Infidel will do that. That's kind of a nice feature. Yeah. It's that smooth. Yes, yeah, so we're talking about for the video, by the way, about how there are, I think there's over 700 versions of the Ultratech now. <laughs> so what role does color play here? You know, um, I, I deal with that a lot, especially when I'm, I'm taking out um, students that are new to the industry and they're, they're really worried about aesthetic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to figure that there's basically a micro tech out there for everybody. But the most important thing is for you to carry a knife that you're going to carry. I love it. <laughs> Classic Simpsons donut, right? Yep. Um, These are the dessert warriors. And I was curious because like, if it's a knife that you're going to carry, then why can't pink and sprinkles be there, right? <laughs> You know, I have no problem with that. <laughs> to be entirely honest, if if that's what was sticking out of me, I'd probably be even less likely to talk about the engagement, <laughs> right? So, you know, people ask me all the time, well, what about this? What about that? And I say, look, carry what you can deploy safely, what you can be accurate and effective with, and that you're actually going to carry. Mm -hmm. Those are the three biggest factors. Now, if they have it in your color, that's great. <laughs> if they don't, go back to like C one through three again. You know what I mean? But I, I think mm -hmm. it's amazing. And that's where the fun comes in, right? Like mm -hmm. I have friends that, you know, they'll they'll put like a three hundred dollar Cerakote job into a five hundred dollar clock. <laughs> and and God bless them, you know. But it More really does tool. it does help you to like resonate with your tool, you know. Mm -hmm. Um all throughout the history of mankind, people have tried to bless their tools. They've tried to customize their tools, anything that they can do. So I think that if that makes you feel more connected to it and it makes you more likely to carry it and more likely to share it with other people, then it is your so duty be to it. carry it. So <laughs> be it, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, realistically, I think it's a really cool knife. And I think that people that that appreciate Microtechs are going to be like, oh, what the heck? Like, you know, <laughs> now everybody's going to want one in their collection. But the big thing is, when you think about this kind of stuff, this isn't something that you should have to deploy a thousand times, right? Mm -hmm. When you think about the tool here, 
it's not supposed to be comfortable. If it were comfortable, everybody would be deploying their knife all the time. You know, <laughs> even with the Emerson Wave, it's gonna destroy your pants. There's going to be some type of a commitment to getting these tools open because you don't want a life-threatening tool opening up on you on accident. Now, I would rather have a rougher button that kind of chews up the edge of my finger a little bit than a tool that opens in my pocket when I don't want it to. So, um, though I, I like do, that. I do understand where he's coming from, um, but you know, one of the things that you'll get with blade work and stick work is you're, you're going to get roughed up a little <laughs> bit, you know. But, but all in all, I think that this is an amazing tool, and I do think of it as the industry standard in your automatic openers. Um, I do really prefer that forward opening versus the side swings just because of how easy it is to get your grip around the tool when you're deploying under pressure. Yep, and that so, way you don't have to like move your fingers to get the blade out yep, of the way. Yep, you got a good solid grip on it. So. Yep. Well, with that we have a few more side openers. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I hear you. Starting with the Benchmade Claymore. And I really like this one because they have a steel reinforced FRN handle, so it's fairly light but you get a nice big CPM D2 blade, so it's gonna be great toughness and hold a good edge. And this button is so big and knurled, something with gloves might be easier to open. And from what I've learned today, I'd see this sort of in the same vein as we talked about with the Recon 1, sort of as a, a field duty knife that can double in a self-defense role. Yeah, and that is so lightweight, like you said. That steel reinforced gives it the ability to have a much lighter profile. And that forward heavy just mm -hmm. makes it feel really comfortable when you move it in your hand. That action's really good too. Good snap. <laughs> yeah, and it seats. If you look here on the back, the way that they accentuated this for a thumb ramp, mm -hmm. seats really nice at the palm heel. I have never thought of that. How, if you're gonna do it in reverse, you need just as much detention as you do. Yeah, unfortunately, if, if you don't have something like that to create a little bit of flare. You can ride right up onto the blade. it's very easy to slide right over if you were to, like we said, flail on a rib or something along those lines, right? Mm -hmm. So I like the way that it feels comfortable in both forward and a reverse grip. It's got that traditional dagger look to the whole handle there, so sure is a beautiful knife, and it feels really comfortable. Yeah, man, I kind of want to go stab something. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> it's been a dangerous yeah, conversation. It forces me to have to barbecue a lot when I'm testing blades. So. <laughs> That's the cold steel way, right? Got to chop <laughs> that meat. Right. Yeah, pork loins and briskets and pork bellies. The next auto we have is from the Kershaw Launch Series. This is a Launch 16. And this one, I'm, I chose this one because I want to talk about serrations. Okay. Where do, where do serrations fit into the self-defense world? You know, I think that they work well for cutting through multiple layers, especially if you have any type of leather involved. Um, now, they're not just in the, the defense world. You have to think also as a first responder, any type of rescue work, cutting through seat belts, cutting through any type of restraint. Um, that serration is gonna give you much more bite into something that's like uh, cordura or nylon. When you start thinking about the weave of a seat belt, if you had to cut through it with just a traditional blade, um, it's gonna take a lot more leverage. And if you have an individual on there, you're either cutting towards them or cutting towards yourself. And so being that able could make to- make another victim real quick. <laughs> being able to kind of think like more like a can opener with the serrations allows a more controlled cutaway. So, um, I, I do like these when I'm carrying it as a worker utility knife. Mm -hmm. um, personally, the reason I'm not as big of a fan of serrations for a defense knife is if I'm going to use the knife also for utility, the serrations can create a little bit of a curveball when it comes to self-sharpening. Like oh. I, I, I don't mind sharpening my traditional blades, even my curved blades, but when it comes to serrations, I just don't feel as confident with it. So I usually end up having to have the knife professionally sharpened if it needs it. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just something to consider. But when you're using a knife as a utility tool and you might need to use it as self-defense, this uh, serration section would enable you to get a bit more bite through durable outer layers. 
So like if somebody has leather on or they have like a heavier nylon jacket, um, something that has like, even how Gore-Tex is like a weaved mm -hmm. uh, fabric, this is just gonna give you a bit more cut through the layers. Now, I do wish it was a little bit higher up towards the, the Tonto feature where the, mm -hmm. the two blade angles are coming together. It would just give a little bit more bite, but with it down here on the belly, it looks like it's more for like a utility purpose. But okay. I, I am a big fan of these. I used to have a farm for a couple of years and I was constantly going around and having to deal with animals and cut little things free and tie things up and um, and, and the serrations, that's when I really started to fall for that. But um, defensively, I usually don't look for the serrated versions when I purchase a defensive knife, mm -hmm. just because I'm a bit more of a poker than a slasher anyway. You know? Okay, I know that Lynn Thompson, the owner of Cold Steel, I guess he mm -hmm. sold it, the, the previous owner of Cold Steel, was a, he's a big proponent of serrations. Yeah. And I was talking to him at Blade Show and he said, because serrations are one more cut no matter what. Mm -hmm. But I think, I, I, I like, I mean, I, I tend to baby my knives too, and I struggle to sharpen serrations. So I think I'm on your team on this one. Sorry, Lynn, I love you. I, you so much. <laughs> it really is about presenting the knife to where the serrations actually make contact too. You'd be surprised how many people when they start cutting they're transferring so much of the energy towards the tip of the tool because that's where the, the physics send the, the power. The apex of the arc. That's it. So, uh, you know, really you have to kind of choke up and press through to get the serrations to be effective. But mm -hmm. it, it does uh, have its place. You just have to understand how to cut with it. And I don't think enough people really train for it so they only get the utility feature of it. But yeah, when you start hacking on pork loins wrapped around a broomstick and, <laughs> you know, because I've been out there for all the fun, you, you do see a difference when you start cutting, but you have to really be able to emphasize it and lean into it, so to speak. All right. Also, can we just unpack the thing that you used to have a farm? You do not exude farmer vibes to me. <laughs> well, you did see the boots on your I did way, see the right? boots. They're beautiful boots. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we had pigs. We had uh, all different types of fowl. Um, it was really just a community way of us getting access to really good quality food, and we shared the labor. But true, but you, you clearly know. eat plenty of protein. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, primarily a carnivore. But uh, that was one of the other awesome parts about it is that um, when you're slaughtering, you know, two three pigs a quarter, you, you get about 10, 12 bodies a year to where you really get to see how your blades interact. So, like uh, Bastian Bastinelli, mm -hmm. um, he's actually a friend of ours, and I teach Mastro Defense System, so I met him through Fred Mastro. Um, he would tell me, send me anything you have. I'll sharpen it and send it back to you. You just pay the shipping. Because he yeah. loved to get other people's blade designs in his hands and feel mm -hmm. them. <laughs> so he would sharpen all of my knives, send them back out, and then I could have a nice rollout for the next <laughs> slaughter. So um, it was really nice to see how some of the bigger choppers would take away the joints and you know break up a, a uh, a carcass real quickly to where you could separate it out and, and have it cleaned up. But uh, a lot of these smaller knives are great for deboning, but they're not going to give you much help when you're when you're taking down a pig. Yeah. So, so I guess this is going back to something I kind of thought of when you're talking about how this is a fruit knife. Like tactical knives are often, like you said, they're built to handle flesh. Mm -hmm. So could you do worse for a butcher knife than a tactical knife? You know, the biggest thing is, is that um, when you're cutting through large amounts of fat, mm -hmm. they get dull very quickly. So they're meant to stick and rip and create a large wound. And ideally, you'd want to sharpen that knife again if you had to use it, especially if you had to cut through some, some thick clothing or a jacket or something, because you may flail off a zipper or, or another uh, a piece of section that mm -hmm. uh, has some type of mechanical compound in a there, A little less right? edge friendly. <laughs> yeah, and that's the thing is like, once you've used that knife, I would want it razor sharp again. So I even tell my students, you know, carry, carry a little small box cutter or something with you that you can use for utility purpose. But if you're specifically carrying a knife for defense, don't be eating your apples with it. Don't open your Amazon packages with it. Don't like, cut your steak. I cringe when I see somebody cut open a cardboard box with a knife that's over $100. It just, 
It's like the nails on the chalkboard to me. But... I'm sorry, I'm so guilty of that. <laughs> I'm I sure. I mean, my other but... knife here, this is my most expensive knife. This is my Protec ATCF operator. This is a $560 oh, knife, and I've opened plenty of boxes oh with it. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry, Patrick, no, I didn't mean to personally. I hear you. It's like sacrilegious, but no, the idea is um, I just want them, if the day ever comes that they need to use that knife to save their life, I just want it to be sharp. And you know, if you get three, four Amazon packages a week, and a year goes by, you've opened 150 packages with that thing, and, now and, your edge and is you gone. probably haven't had to hit, cut a single person with it, right? <laughs> but the day that you need it, please just make sure that your knife is sharp. You know, that's the maintenance side of it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why just the serrations I tend to, you know, navigate around for my personal choice, but. Yeah, because you got to keep yeah, that they're, Well, they're mostly for defense. I don't have the farm anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, and then the next brand we have here is Protech. And Protech has their Tactical Response series. And I know that this is the TR3 that came out, and recently the folks over at Protech went to the SEAL Team 3 reunion because oh. SEAL Team 3 carries the TR3. So Interesting. I guess when I hear that, sort of going back to the real conversation, that makes me feel like this is, it fits in the same as the Claymore and, and the Recon 1, where it's a, a utility knife that can double in a self-defense and tactical role. Wow, that's got a nice spring in it. They hit so hard. I don't yeah. know how they make those spring coils. That does feel really nice. Mm hmm So I guess, would you carry that for everyday carry? Or would you, would you save that for the more tactical roles? You know, um, I could see myself carrying something like this. You know, the, the only reason why I feel real comfortable carrying it is because upon deployment, we work on single-handed deployment while creating something to fill space. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're not in a position where you're having to lift your shirt to get to your tool or you're in a position where you've got to ready it with two hands, I'm a firm believer these one-handed tools, they're great for being able to create space and stun somebody at the same time. Which, to be honest, if you're effective with your stun, you may not need to follow up with the knife at all. So um, uh, I feel real comfortable with this. I also like that it has significantly more punch. Not to pick on the Kalashnikov or anything like that because I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that these are radically different price points just yeah, from the feel. Yeah, these ones are pushing 300. Point. These ones are about 60 bucks. Right. <laughs> so, and and you can definitely feel it, guys. I know through the camera, it's a little hard to tell, but when you feel the way that this knife pops open and locks into place, it just feels very reliable. Now, when you start thinking about gripping here, they've also got enough recess on that button where I don't feel like I'm gonna accidentally squeeze it if I'm having to pry on somebody with this. There's a nice healthy gap in there between my hand and that button when I choke up on it. And when you feel this here, your pinky seats in and it locks this nice against the palm. It's got just that ever so slight little hook at the yeah. back. Just like that, oh my goodness, I've learned so much about her a nice little ramp on the hilt of that because this also helps you to not slide over the blade when you have your thumb. That gives you the ability to have a secondary contact point. Uh, Protect is such a good word. The safety feels really nice too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the Protec I need to get. I really love the TR3. Yeah, it's a nice knife. And, and I'll be honest, if I had to use something like this defensively, if it were to become exhibit A, it doesn't look as uh, purpose-built, you know? Yeah, like when you, you start do. looking at some of these curved blades or, <laughs> you know, some of these look like... Which one's going to endear the jury? <laughs> right. Some of these look like they're designed specifically to be used for defense, right? And mm -hmm. this has the appearance of more of a well-rounded traditional pocket knife. So, I really, I classic design. And at that chamfered uh, spine. Mm-hmm. It's just going to allow that little chamfering there. Mm -hmm. It's going to allow for a little bit more manipulation if you had to use it. So, 
Such a good knife. And then the next one is from Bob Terzuola. I don't know if you've heard that name floating around. I haven't, but... Um, he I... coined the term tactical knife. Really? Yeah. Okay. And I got this from the ProTech booth at Blade Show when I met Bob Terzuola. He's, he's getting up there in age, but he's still as bright and smiley as ever. But this is his design, the ATCF, which stands for Advanced Technology Combat Folder. So this one's the automatic version. But I'm curious to see how you would use this. And I also want to ask about this thumb ramp. I think I might know the answer from the earlier conversation. But he puts that thumb ramp there, and that's kind of his hallmark. But how does that help? So you have various different types of forward grip. You have what's called a hammer grip, a saber grip that's similar to how you would hold a sword. This is definitely designed for more of that saber grip. This thumb ramp allows for you to kind of lock into place. He's got a chamfered reverse edge there, if you can see that. Mm -hmm. It also allows for a bit more manipula uh, manipulation if you're inside. Uh, in a trunk situation, you're gonna be able to move around against the ribs a little bit easier without flailing against the rib. Um, now, just bear in mind, when you have a knife like this with a little bit wider belly, it's definitely made with an accentuation for the slashing. And I also like the fact that this doesn't have a safety. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of safeties when it comes to automatic holders. Mm -hmm. Personally, I believe that if I need to have a safety, then the button design maybe could have used a little bit more deep thought. So uh, personally, I like the fact that it doesn't have a safety. It's got a recessed button. Um, also here, if you start thinking about utilizing this as a reverse grip, um, depending on how I pull this out, I might want to just seat this in my hand and use it as a reverse grip tool. Mm -hmm. So when you start feeling, I've noticed too, the longer I've been holding this, like my hands are a little bit sweaty, but mm -hmm. it's just feeling better in my hand. It's almost getting stickier the longer I hold it. Yeah, this so. one has a G10 inlay. So the operator series is where the Protex will have no logos and then a tritium bile in the button. Mm -hmm. So the button glows in the dark. Kind of fun. No, that's kind of cool. Yeah, but this is the first one with the G10 handle. And I really like that because, I, like you said, it, it gets grippier as you get sweatier. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of nice. And it's like that matte feel, I think, gives it a nicer feel too rather than it. You know, some of these glossier knives, mm -hmm. they just, they feel like they're a little slick. Mm -hmm. you know? That nice chalky uh, aluminum, I love it. Now, you can also choke up and back off the thumb ramp here. I'm a little bit more comfortable choking up on the blade here. And I feel more comfortable seating my thumb in that thumb ramp mm -hmm. and putting more leverage on the back of the blade to assist with a cut. So I, I feel like this has a lot of versatility. You can tell that they've jibbed. Mm -hmm. So you've got bite there. Might have added a little bit more <laughs> up on the back of the knife there. That hammer grip style. Yeah, That's just to get a little bit hard up on there. But sure is a beautiful knife though. Feels great. I love it. I love it so much. Um, yeah, you should get one if you don't. <laughs> Talking to you. <laughs> All right, and then next up, we have another Cold Steel. This might be the best-selling fixed blade at Blade HQ, and that is the, I, I forget which push dagger this is, but it's from that series. Yeah. Safe Maker? A lot of the guys are carrying these right next to their appendix carry. It mm -hmm. gives them a nice quick alternative. When you think about the, the draw position, if I'm in a position here to have to draw and I can just switch offline, Mm -hmm. This just gives me a secondary option, but it's very comfortable if you're in a seated position all day. You know, with these little guys though, um, if you aren't used to the punch dagger as a tool, you just want to make sure that you actually feel what it feels like to punch this into some flesh. Because so, get yourself a pig. <laughs> yeah, you just, it's, it's kind of easy to get a little bit of an offset, but to feel what it feels like to bury this into something, you might stick it in and turn it and then release. So it's locking in 
to that wound where it slid in sideways and turns and makes it a lot more difficult to pull out. Especially if you encountered ribs along the way. But if you punch and retract and get a couple hits in with something like this, a lot of times people uh, are obsessed with the waist up and it tends to be kind of a Western ego thing. But one of the best places that if you had to use an edged weapon defensively is gonna be the waist down because in the thigh section you have femoral and um, you get um, much more of an immediate reaction when you affect the blood supply down there. And that's so, probably preparing to defend face and yeah, chest, Yeah, and, right? and a lot of times too, if you can create your stun to the high line and your secondary, your follow-up strike to the low line, people are so concerned with what they initially experience, they leave this stuff wide open. Or they don't even, um, the hands don't come back, they move the upper high line back and leave the low line exposed. So, Nobody has eyes in their hips. Yeah, and <laughs> you know, I really do express a lot because I'm a firearms instructor, I teach combatives, I work with police officers, I teach protection details, you name it. I, I run security at a nightclub. Um, most of my problems as a civilian, not being law enforcement, most of my problems happen within an arm's reach away. Mm -hmm. That's why my edged weapons tend to be more of my go-to. I do carry a firearm, but but it's not an ideal tool when the danger is within an arm's reach away. I, mm -hmm. uh, the, the firearm's only effective at one particular angle, whereas in my edged weapon, whatever angle I can manipulate my wrist to, it can become effective. So, you know, I really have more people that once they train edged weapon, they, they can feel that reliance on the gun melting away because mm -hmm. they, they start realizing, you know, there's a lot of liability to affecting the world at a distance. Mm -hmm. I can justify protecting myself. I can justify protecting, you know, my direct family or, or whatever is in my charge with a tool that only works within my reach because you have to come within my personal space for me to effectively use it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you see this carried right next to a holster, that tells me that that individual is really dead set on doing anything they can to not have to pull their gun. And that to me like seems just like such a responsible standpoint, right? Because mm -hmm. let's face it, the beauty of an edged weapon is if you attack me and I pull my edged weapon and I go to use it and I'm say, uh, ineffective, I miss. Mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about the potential collateral behind you, right? Yeah, there's not somebody 20 yards away that's gonna get a knife in the leg. And I have people <laughs> I've met that are full grown adults. They've never held a gun, but most of them have held a knife mm -hmm. multiple times a day, you know? <laughs> so it, it tends to be something that I can get people familiar with much faster, but you're seeing more and more of your protection and duty guys carrying this punch dagger, this specific one right next to their appendix carry firearm or right next to their their off 90 you know and and that to me like that's some reassurance anytime i see somebody that carries a gun and no knife usually makes me a little nervous you know so we have an it guy upstairs and he he carries a glock 26 every day and mm -hmm. in his right pocket he has an extra magazine i'm like you gotta put a knife there <laughs> and he's like no my my glock's gonna do it and i'm like well let's see your yeah. glock open your amazon package but like you said don't okay yeah. Maybe I'm on nobody's He'll team be here. Dragging his, his <laughs> sight on the, his front sight across it, right? Yep. <laughs> no, I hear you. Uh, I just, I do feel like, for instance, a, a hammer is a great hammer, but it's a lousy screwdriver. Mm -hmm. You know? And I think that having an array of tools is what's going to allow you to be best prepared for the situation, you know? I think you're right. I, I, I gotta say, that was like mind blowing what you were just talking about. How, like, what I, what I learned from that at least is before I should go take a concealed carry class, before I should start thinking, how am I gonna carry a gun? I should start thinking, I already carry a knife. How can I use that for the same purpose? Yeah. And then I don't have to get a gun in a holster. I don't have to, I don't, I don't have to carry a gun to work and declare it with HR. I, I have a knife, which is mostly socially acceptable, and that is a very useful self-defense tool. Yeah, and here you're not really limited, you know? You you can carry any knife that's on this table here in the state of Utah. God bless us, right? <laughs> uh, you know, but at the same time, it, it's like, say you just wanna drive cross country, or you wanna go see a couple national parks, you're gonna be very limited, you know? I, I mean, we're seeing a lot of places where constitutional rights are being restricted, 
but oftentimes you can still carry some form of an edged weapon with you, right? Yeah, I'd um, say part of being a prepared citizen is being a law-abiding citizen. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, let's face it, you know, like uh, you're really only good if you can be capable and, you know, choose mm -hmm. to be good, right? So um, this, I think, the, the, the reality of the edged weapon is that I've taken small children, six, seven years old, and I'll pull them in the back and I'll show them some line work and how to move and move efficiently. And then I'll give them a Sharpie marker, take them back out in front, grab dad and say, I want you to pick up your child and take them out to the parking lot, but you can't get marked by the Sharpie. And now you see this little kid <laughs> and they're like zoned in and they, they want to be successful. And I, I tell dad, imagine if that was a 17 year old and imagine if I had five hours instead of five minutes and now they see the reality real quickly how they the blade. instead of a Sharpie. <laughs> right, right, the blade creates an immediate accountability. And mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately we live in a world where people don't respect other people's boundaries all the time, right? But mm -hmm. this allows for you to hold people accountable for their behavior. and. And God forbid you ever have to use a, a piece of metal on another human being. Uh, but at the same time, if if they make that decision to attack you, they philosophically have forfeited their well-being. That's the mm -hmm. way our laws are created, right? So uh, I always try to tell people, like, if you can start with an edged weapon and you can become capable of that and you learn deployment, if you go to learn the gun, now we have a set of body mechanics that we can build off of. And there's a correlation. There's some continuity with that. Mm -hmm. So if you learn how to deploy and create space to get a knife out well, then if you still feel like you need a gun, we can work on that. But I feel like before I should worry about affecting the world all around me, let's worry about this little circle within an arm's reach of me first, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because if I can do that, then I can effectively enlarge that circle as we go on, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, and then I guess sort of off of the small everyday carry stuff, we have some bigger fixed blades, and these are super common in the tactical world, at least so far as sales are concerned. So that's the Cold Steel SRK, and I imagine that fighting with one of those is a very different experience than fighting with one of these. Yeah, you know, these are your like your traditional combat knives. You think World War One, World War Two. Uh, Vietnam, Korea, these traditional broad blade combat knives were really nice. A lot of times people would use these for splitting wood. You know, you figure the thickness of that blade there. It's almost a fifth of an inch. Right, you're in a position where if I needed to use this and pound on it with another piece of wood, I could use it to split wood, I could use it to prep firewood, I could attach it to a, a shaft and make some type of makeshift spear out of it. Um, you're seeing that a lot with these more, I guess you would say, utility style, hunting style, military-esque blades. Now, also you can tell they put a little bit more work into the sheath here to give an off-thigh mm -hmm. drop. And also, when you look here, they've got some lashing, so if you wanted to try to attach this to a plate carrier or something, you could. Now, when you start thinking of stuff like this with a vertical drop, being able to just tug and go, pretty classic, you know? You see something like this in your older uh, military movies where they just have it dangling from the front of their carrier. Now, when you think of stuff like this, it is definitely purpose-built and it's a duty knife. But when you think of a civilian carrying this, if I'm not going camping or going out into the wilderness for a couple of days, this might be a little much. Somebody's gonna um, ask some questions. <laughs> yeah, and, and you heard me actually talk about um, being a, a little guy, if my traditional belt loop was here, this, this would put this knife kind of like poking right me in the ribs. ribs. So what they do is they, they add this little drop here so that when it hangs off your belt, it allows for some freedom of movement if you're hiking or having to go through some rough terrain. Whether you're in military or not, or it's a recreational camping thing, this just gives you a little bit of offset so that you have some freedom of movement. So that nice rubber grip does feel good. Um, this knife has a good uh, protective coating on it, so it's not gonna require a lot of maintenance. Mm -hmm. you know? My favorite thing about this knife, they go for like 50 bucks. I know, cold steel is an incredible deal. You know, I had an instructor one time that was like, 
Um, I think one of the students was like saying something about cold steel not costing much, so how good could the quality be? <laughs> and, and my teacher just kind of laughed and he <laughs> said, you know, the thing that you guys don't understand is that a cold steel knife, though, yes, it's not a folded steel Japanese sword, right? Um, the steel and the quality and the durability of that blade would be better than any blade you would have come across even if you were royalty a few hundred years ago. So when you start thinking about the modern technology that we have, Cold Steel puts out an amazing product. For the price, they, they have tons of options and it's a great entry level place to start. Now, if I were to hold up this knife compared to like, um, you know, one of your custom makers where you're putting in seven, eight hundred dollars for a fixed blade side knife. It's got some super powder steel handle. Uh... Right, or, or, or a <laughs> lot of times you're just, you're paying to have one of the rare pieces made by a specific maker, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and because of the way that they do their craftsmanship or the, the love they put into their art, a lot of times you're paying for a specific name. Now, if you're a weekend warrior and you're gonna go out camping with your family a few times a year, <laughs> There's no shame in having a cold steel knife Sign me up. <laughs> just because it's $50, you know? Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, really you have to think about what your investment level is and it's a tool. You're gonna abuse it, you know? With this particular knife, I'm not gonna feel bad if I'm holding it over a chunk of log and I'm splitting it to make <laughs> some smaller kindling but I can't exactly do that with my folders. <laughs> it, the mechanism's not gonna uphold it. So, you know, you have to think about uh, the tool and, and the purpose, right? Yeah. So. And the last one's the Gerber Strong Arm. And this one, I would say is five, seven years old now. Mm -hmm. This is the new version with the stonewashed blade, but these have been very popular in the military. Yeah, didn't they put out another version of this that had a couple of pinholes here too for lashing? Uh, yes, they did. It was the survival version, ultimate survival. Yeah. I could be wrong. But yeah, a very similar knife indeed. Yeah, similar mindset. You know, they do a lot of the stuff with these because they want you to have the ability to put your cord wrap for retention. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do off of these to make a reinforced loop so that if you're doing something with it, you could set the knife down temporarily and, and it's still attached to you. Or if I'm in a combat type of a situation and I get a little shock value to my balance, if my hand's open and the knife falls away, you can literally have the lanyard where you can whip it around and catch it. <laughs> um, and you can spin it and it comes back around in a reverse grip. So having one of these lanyard holes for a defensive knife, it's kind of a, a nice feature. Um, when you start thinking about this guy, it could be doubled as a pry bar. So this is definitely a utility knife. Um, if you had to use it defensively, you've got great seating on your pinky and the palm heel. You do have enough of a neutral angle here to where you can get a thumb ramp on there. And even here, you're seating in if I needed to use the pommel to be able to strike with. So this has a lot of versatility to it. It's just, this is kind of an all arounder knife. If you just wanna have mm -hmm. one tool that you could use and you had to use it defensively or just as a camping utility knife, these are really nice. Um, I'm guessing these are in a similar price range too, right? Uh, these ones go for about $90 right now. Okay. okay. But made in the USA. Yeah. I really it, love that. This feels like an upgraded handle too versus the mm -hmm. one I was asking you about. Yeah. It's got the nice rubberized handle and I love the diamond texture on it. Yeah. It's nice to give it a little bit of texture when you feel that upright. Sometimes when you have the rubberized, if it's too smooth, it, if it gets wet, it's just going to slip right out of your hand. Mm -hmm. well, it feels really good. Yeah, so one of my favorite features of the strong arm is actually the sheath. So the sheath allows for either direction of going in and out. Yep. Locks really solid. And then what you can do is you can pop this nylon thing out and there's a plate so you can use it horizontally on your belt. And when I carry a fixed blade, that's usually how I do it. I wear it small in my bag. Right. How, how do you feel about that? I'm curious. You know, I used to really like it, but I got more and more nervous because over the last 10 years, especially here in the United States, you've seen street violence get more and more aggressive. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder for me to feel like I'm in control of a blade when it's not 
uh, in a place I can interface with. Now, I, I tend to have this ongoing discussion with firearms instructors about appendix carry because I prefer that appendix carry and mm -hmm. a lot of people think that it can be dangerous. Um, I personally believe that if you're gonna shoot yourself, you're probably gonna do it no matter where you carry your gun. <laughs> but <laughs> it tends to be an operator error thing if you ask me, it's yeah. not about location. But I, I tend to carry my tools in the front just because I feel like I have the most control over them, right? Yeah, but on um, the back, you have to reach and then you're yeah. exposing your front. And, and that's the thing is if I was gonna do something where um, where I didn't feel like I was uh, at any type of peril or jeopardy and I could get that tool out of the way, it's a great place for it. Like say I was gonna be working on a ranch and I was gonna have a bigger knife like that. Mm -hmm. But just bear in mind, it, it's like, it's not something I would feel comfortable at all. When I see people and they're open carrying, uh, especially with no retention built into a holster and they're waiting in line at the grocery store, it's like just about anybody in that grocery store could get to that gun as fast as they can because there's nothing really keeping it locked in, right? So when so you think about that carry, you have to think about what your exposure is, right? Mm -hmm. If you're on private land or you're out camping or you're gonna be hiking and you're not necessarily worried about somebody coming up behind you and grabbing a hold of your tool, then that's one thing. But for me to carry regularly like that, I'm not a big fan just because I tend to be in and out of a vehicle all day long. Um, I'm usually at the 90, just in front of that meridian, mm -hmm. like we talked about, right? And um, and I tend to be uh, in the space where, I use the football analogy. If I gave you a football and I said, I want you to run down the field with it, you wouldn't hold it out here. You wouldn't hold it behind your back. <laughs> you wouldn't hold it up over your head like this, right? It's gonna be but right there. But yeah, <laughs> you're, you're gonna like try to get as much of your body around that football as you can, so that if somebody's reaching and trying to pull on it, you, you've got coverage. So if I think of like my tool set, by me having that here, I feel like if I had to go into a prone position, I could cover and protect and, and get to the deployment of my tools the best. There's nothing that's gonna kill me on the back. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and that's the thing is like, if, if I'm having to get to my tools and I have to get back here, it creates a lot of opening and exposure. Um, also, I have to go backwards before I can go forward. Um, if, if it's okay, can I show you something just biomechanically real yeah, quick? Yeah, let's do it. All right, so if you have your hand down at your side, okay. and right now you're just in front of your meridian because your hands are relaxed. Mm -hmm. Now if I put my hand here, and I'm gonna hold sternly with my shoulder, I want you to push and, and act like I'm not even, yeah. Feel that? Yeah. Okay, go ahead one more time, good. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just gonna put you behind your meridian, and I'm gonna use one finger now. Go ahead and push. Oh, wow. How does that work? Like, I guess it must be a center of mass thing. That's incredible. So <laughs> when you're in front of your meridian, you can use your tricep, you can use your chest, and you can use your lat to push forward. But the moment that I set you behind your meridian, we disengage your lat, we disengage your tricep, and now you're trying to just use your chest to move that arm forward. So biomechanically, that's how much weaker you are if you have to reach beyond that meridian to grab your tool. So it doesn't have to be all of me trying to stop you. Just a finger's worth. Does that make sense? That makes a so, lot of sense. So when I try to teach people why I carry where I carry and how I deploy and the reason for that, it's because there's a biomechanical advantage that allows for me to use every bit of me, okay? Mm -hmm. And if my life is on the line, I don't wanna use one muscle group when I could use three, you know? So mm -hmm. some of these little things that you start learning and then how to exploit that, it, it just, it, it gives you such a superior biomechanical advantage. So hopefully that gives some insight. Yeah, and I'm thinking like, if I were going to draw a knife for self-defense here, knowing that now, I would immediately go for this arm because this arm is like, it's my weakness now. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what we'll do is we'll do deployment under pressure. This is where the trainers come into play and why it's so important because once you feel like you have your deployment and you're, you're set, then we would start within an arm's reach of each other. Mm -hmm. And whenever you're ready, you're gonna Watch deploy. Attack, yeah. <laughs> and and, and uh, you deploy and I try to hinder it. And if you can effectively create space and deploy with the other hand, then I can't stop you. 
But if I'm able to close distance and hinder your deployment, then something's wrong with your mechanics and we need to revisit it, right? So uh, a lot of people work the deployment of the gun. Mm -hmm. The old proverbial quick draw. You know? Gotta have a sub one second yeah, shot. Yeah. But you'd I've be surprised how, how few people can sub second with their knife deployment. So. Yeah. So you know what? I think we should try it. Yeah. Let's go do it. All right, let's do it. Bob used to live in customer service, and after Karen's would call in, they would show Bob the what for, and as you can see, some people got a little happy with the edges and stabbed him, cut him, all that. Yeah, a little bit. So I, I'm really curious about some of the tactics you were showing me with, like, the, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, hooking and that sort of thing? Yeah. And I, I'd love to see how you give Bob the what for with that. All right, very good. <laughs> I'm gonna grab just one of these yeah. little blades over here. I'll Please do. With, start with a traditional karambit here. Um, one of the things to think about with a tool like this is that a lot of times people will get fixated there we go. So a lot of times people will get concerned with the upper portion of the body, which if I move in here, I could be distracting at the same time that I'm cutting. And that's why being able to body block the tool with your thigh here is such an effective thing. But even if I'm going to the high line, I could be also moving to the low line here. And one of the other things to think about is even if I had to move in and crush and close distance, being able to utilize this tool to the lower portions of the body. It gives me an ability to be effective out of the plane of vision. So um, even if I was to end up in more of like a close quarters, like pummeling type of a situation, this allows for me to be able to dig in and affect the body back here by doing little digs and flicks. So even if I was in a position where I needed to be up top, I can hook and start pulling and clearing and creating space. So when you see this, traditionally it's held by the grip here, but you have the ability to flail as well by flicking that out, which is something I did earlier on the video with the new blade coming out of Fox, the Pical. When you flick, this doesn't even have to be at the tip of the blade, it could be the spine itself and any hits up here tend to create little nicks or splits and that can create blood into the eyes. So you'll see with traditional blade, they'll work more of a boxing stance and they're flailing and trying to get any type of disruption to the brow line and that's gonna get blood to come down into the eyes. Even if I'm in a position here, I can be flicking across and scoring. It's not that it's gonna create an incredible wound, but with the pressure going up to the headline, you get a lot of blood into the eyes. So uh, a lot of times what we'll do is we'll work on movement to get off the center line so that you're not in front of the threat. And while doing that, you're also defending and looking for a flank. So having one of these bobs, it's a great tool because it gives you the ability to start working on your footwork. It gives you the ability to start thinking about getting your strong side away from an aggressor so that you can effectively deploy and also how to start looking for angles of attack because it doesn't matter if we're talking about wrestling, boxing, MMA, a street fight. If I circled a little bit, that aggressor is gonna circle and face me. So the most effective thing I can do is get off of this center line of space. So the majority of the movement that I'm doing, I'm gonna be trying to get off of that center line. And once I can do that, re-angle back towards the aggressor. Now I have all of my tools and all of my weapons facing them, and all of his tools and all of his weapons are facing off yonder. And that <laughs> gives me a, an ideal position to start uh, dealing with this aggression. So when you start thinking about being able to effectively move to a space like that, stunning, cutting, and following up, this gives you some basic motions that you could practice at home quite easy and, and really get comfortable with it. That way you get a living, breathing body in front of you again and you wanna work your training. You have effective movement to start with. So this is some of the stuff that I would do. Even if I did have to stay in the front here, maybe a, a doorway is being blocked so there is no left, there is no right. Mm -hmm. For me to 
effectively move in this space and be stunning and slashing, following up and being able to effectively move, but in a way that allows for me to be economical and, mm -hmm. and effective. Even if I come up here to go and um, stun and slash, hands might come up. So if this gets blocked, then I'm doing my follow-up and cutting out, grabbing and preparing for follow-up. So when you see these movements, I can strike about four times in about a second, and it's really just because I'm relaxed and I'm comfortable and I, I have an idea of the space and how I'd move within it. And you've trained so, it over and over and over again. Yeah, and, and now when I don't have a bob and I get a real body here, um, even if I'm here and I go to slash and you get in my way, then oh, I'm poking. Right there. <laughs> yeah, and as I pull out, you see how it creates an effect on the body. Now, now if you did take a a stab to the abdomen. I would not be back up. <laughs> right, most people prone. So, and, and you see how that exposes the next line of target. So if we go nice and slow, yeah. if I'm in here and I poke, mm -hmm. then we get that little bend. Now this <laughs> gives me the lines that I need to I'm follow toast. up. I'm toast. <laughs> so, though the movements don't show much on Bob, <laughs> because we don't get any physical uh, pain response. Mm -hmm. But when you go to move on to a real body, if I poke at that liver, you hollow at the waist a little bit and then the next target presents itself. So when you can get comfortable working on this guy, then you get a body that actually responds to the physical discomfort. Now all of a sudden your movements are even that much more accentuated. But, but you could think like, do I need <laughs> to practice a thousand times on my partner or could I, I get that knocked out on this static training tool? So um, that's just a little bit about this particular blade, I suppose. So. Okay, so I wanna try something. I wanna grab this trainer right here. Mm -hmm. This is the Cold Steel Leatherneck Trainer. Yes. And I imagine this is the kind of knife that your average untrained thug would try to mug somebody with. Yeah. So I'm gonna be an untrained thug and I'm gonna try and mug you. Okay. And your job is to prevent me from doing so. I'm gonna lose okay. these glasses for in case I earn a black eye. Fair and square. <laughs> Just... Okay. All right. So do I put this guy down or? No, you can use that one or whichever knife you prefer. Okay. Uh, if you want, actually, why don't we have you use this Emerson one? This one that allows for the quick deployment, this guy right here. Right. Because that way you're just a guy on the street and I'm gonna not like you very much. This'll be fun, right? Yeah. All right. Hey, you, give me your wallet. Oh, just, just relax, man. I, I, I don't want any trouble. I don't want... <laughs> Dang. You are quick, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, you're waving a knife around in my face. I gotta <laughs> take control of it. Yeah, you now, did you notice? For that. No, because if I go one hand to one hand and you have a knife in yours and I'm fumbling over here, I'm better off to try to control. And once I took your balance, mm -hmm. did you notice how your concentration on the knife kind of faded away? Mm -hmm. Now, I always relate this to kind of slipping in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's composed while they're washing, but the moment they slip, everything just kind of splays out. So once I take your balance, I wasn't so much worried about the knife and I could use my two hands against your one, right? Mm -hmm. So when you feel the aggression that you had here, the first thing I did was try to get my hands in a little bit closer place. Because if I do this, do you feel like you're in control now? No, but I get a little overconfident when you're like this. Yeah, and, and when you were coming at me aggressively and I give you a state of fear and compliance, it, it makes you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. Now, like I got the first thing I said wallet. is just, just calm down. I'll give you whatever you want. But now really, I'm confident. I... Yeah, and, and I want you to start thinking about what you want because there's a certain amount of effectiveness of taking away the OODA loop, okay? Do you, are you familiar with that? I'm not. OODA loop stands for observe, orient, decide, act. It's a four stage process that happens anytime we have to assess our environment and make a decision. Mm -hmm. So while you're coming at me, I've observed and I've oriented myself and I've already made a decision, but I'm waiting for the right moment to act. So while you're here, you've decided you wanna rob me, right? Yep. And if I do anything stupid, you already know what you wanna do, right? Yeah. <laughs> so here, the moment that I go to move, you cut, okay? Okay. Good, very good, that's what I want, right? Mm -hmm. Now, now, what do you want from me? I want your wallet. <laughs> what happened to your cut? 
it's gone because I wasn't thinking about what I wanted. <laughs> that's right. And that's what I did to you in the moment that you came at me. Whether you knew it or not, I was like, just, just relax, just calm down, I'll give you whatever you want. And then as soon as you felt confident with that knife, I went. But mm -hmm. the idea is to give you a false sense of confidence and also to commit you to it. If, if time would have went much longer and I didn't feel like I had my chance, I would have said, dude, I'll give you whatever you want. Do you want my keys? Do, do you want my wallet? And oh, what does this, and I see what what this force going. you to do? Uh, yeah, I do want your You mind. have to answer. Yeah. During the moment that you answer, what are you not thinking about? I'm not thinking about cutting your neck. That's what I'm not thinking. So you can focus on one thing at a time, but if I can use little psychological tricks to lessen the chance of you being focused on that knife, and also if I can let you give me permission to reach for what? Uh, your wallet. <laughs> yeah, and the crazy part is, okay, I just, my, my wallet's in my back pocket. Now and all of a sudden we start having different interactions <laughs> with each other, right? Mm -hmm. So usually I'll never reach for something without being without giving permission first, and I'll make you give me permission by leading you down the path. It's like, okay, uh, 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 I'll give you whatever you want. I, I got a car. You want my car? I got car keys. I just cashed my paycheck. There's money in my wallet, but mm -hmm. I'm engaging you and I'm forcing you to have to answer a question. I train this a lot, but I don't just understand the physical responses. I understand the psychological responses as well to give me the advantage physically. Okay. okay. And this is what I feel like, like I, I have a big knife collection, right? Yeah. But I feel like people get redundancy in equipment and they don't invest into training. And, and I feel like you could have an array of tools at home and feel like that translates to capability. But as you find, there's, there's actual techniques and strategies that I'm employing that make all of the, the fighting stuff work, so. Well, this has been truly life-changing, Patrick. Well, I've learned a lot today, it. and I gotta come take one of your classes one of these days. Anytime, be my guest. Well, wonderful. Um, so. If, for all of you watching at home, I hope that you have seen that that knife that is in your pocket that we are talking about all the time is a very useful tool to help you and your family stay safe if you know what you're doing. So if you're local, take a class from Patrick. And I know that he's got a lot of compatriots or a lot of colleagues all over the country who can help you out as well. So Absolutely. get yourself a tactical knife, get yourself some training, and keep yourself safe. Thanks, Patrick. My pleasure. <laughs>